It's a uh, it's amazing how man, how how much Peter's words complement Paul's words and they complement James' words. I was telling somebody uh, just recently how there are people out there who who reject Paul's writings because they say, well, they contradict James' writings. James is all about you know works, and Paul was about fa- grace, and so. Uh, they want to believe in works-based salvation, I guess. So they say, no, Paul's writings are not true. And I'm like, man, if you think they con- they contradict each other, you're missing something because everything in the Bible just fits together so well. And uh, every time I hear it read or read it myself, I'm just so blessed by that. <clears throat> All right, so uh, look again here at the text he just read, First Peter chapter 4. And uh, look at verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Look over at James. A few books back. James uh, chapter 5, look at verse 20. James concludes his book, his letter like this. Let him know that he which confer, converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The title of the message this morning is How to Cover a Multitude of Sins. James and Peter pretty much uh, said something very similar there as far as covering a multitude of sins. <clears throat> so by way of introduction, let me just explain, first of all, what I don't mean. Number one, you can't ever cover your sins for salvation. <laughs> you can't be like, well, man, I messed up. I made a sin. So I, I, I did the sin. So let me just cover that up by doing something good or, uh, you know, no amount of penance or anything like that is going to cover your, your sins. We understand that, that the only way we have our sins covered in that way is by what Jesus already did for us. And we receive that gift. That's kind of a covering of, of, of sorts of our sins. Covered by the blood. You've heard that expression, and that's what we're talking about. That's the only way to have those sins covered for our salvation. There's nothing we can do to cover those, those sins. They're open before God. God knows our hearts. He know, There's nothing that's going to be uh, hidden. So uh, not only can you not cover up your sins for salvation, but once you're saved, once you're a Christian, uh, you might think that you can get away with certain sins because like, we all fall from time to time and we might commit this sin. And you might think, well, that's all right. I'm just going to deal with it and uh, try to run from it and pretend like it didn't happen. Well, the inevitable is happening, especially God chastens those who he loves. And you can rest assured. And that's something as Christians that helps motivate us. Not that we should live in terror in that way necessarily. I mean, there, that's not wrong to fear the Lord, obviously. But uh, uh, not that we should live in terror necessarily. But we should know that God wants us to improve. He wants us to be better. And so he's going to deal with things in our life that we might keep hidden for a while. But the Bible makes it very clear. Numbers 32, 23 says, But if ye will not do so, do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. I don't know how many times that scripture has come to mind. When something happens, you're like, be sure your sins will find you out. Everybody who's tried to live in uh, a life of sin and continue to serve the Lord and keep that sin hidden, they all come to the same conclusion. Eventually, your sin will find you out. And of course, we know that if if you are able to keep it hidden for some for some reason from the majority of the people, well, then God knows it and he, it will be revealed. Okay, so... Uh, your sin will find you out. So you can't hide or cover up your sin and expect that you're going to get away with something. You're not going to get caught for doing that sin. That's not what we're saying. Here's what we're saying. Here's what I'm uh, what I'm making the application from the, these verses. You can deal with your sin and resolve it. If particular, if it's a sin between you and a brother or something like that, it can be resolved. You can repair the relationship with the people against whom you sinned, and uh, and that's what we're talking about. Over the sin, we're talking about so that you can move on. Now, on the surface, you might look at that and say, wait, 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 wouldn't that be uncover the sin? I mean, if you're going to deal with it, it means you're going to get it in the open, you're going to uncover it, and, uh, and you might think of it that way. Well, let me say it this way. <clears throat> 
after a sin is uncovered, you need to cover it, <laughs> okay? After a sin is uncovered, right, we get this right. How does the Bible say, if you, your brother has ought against you, you know, go to him. And, uh, and, and if you have uh, ought against somebody else, you go to them. I mean, either way, the idea is, hey, there's something going on. Somebody sinned against somebody else or whatever. You go to them and you say, hey, let's deal with this. You know what you're doing? You're uncovering that. And now you're going to deal with it. But when you deal with it, what you're doing is actually covering it. You're closing it. You're putting a... You're, you're, you're sealing it up and you're, and you're putting a stop to it, you know, where it's no longer a problem anymore. That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> At the end of the message, I'll, I'll uh, tell you what I used to think that it meant. And I always kind of scratched my head. I didn't think that was exactly what it meant, but, um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Okay, that'll be the final conclusion. So what do we mean here uh, about covering the sin? First of all, before I give these main points of the sermon, I want to show you that every step, okay, the, the secret to every step of this process of how to cover a multitude of sins is based in one word which defines Christianity, which is love, okay? Now, I know you say, oh, that sounds like a mushy, you know, <laughs> here's a super just lovey, mushy kind of guy. No, look, you cannot separate love from the Bible. You cannot separate love from the Christian life and be like, you know, no, you know what? Love is fine for you, but for me, I'm gonna exp I'm gonna, you know, practice the Christian life without love. It doesn't happen. It's all gonna be based in love, okay? And so I'll show you uh, on some of these points here. It's all gonna be based in love. But first, go to Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs 17. Verse 9. Proverbs 17, verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Okay, we're going to come back and look at this scripture again, but here's the main thing. First of all, you might think covereth me means, you know, hiding it or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But the opposite would be this, he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends, okay? So covering has to do with getting it over with, finish, being, closing it up and, and making it a done deal, okay? Uh, and so here's the point that I wanted to show you, though. Uh, he that covereth a transgression, okay, he, he's wanting to deal with, he's wanting to resolve it. What is he doing? He's seeking love, okay? He's, he, he's, want, he's motivated by love. He wants to resolve this because he loves his brother. He loves the Lord. And so, uh, and so he wants to resolve this. We'll come back to that verse here in a minute. Okay, so how can we cover a multitude of sins? I'll give you three, uh, three points here. Okay, number one, this is more preventative maintenance, okay? <clears throat> Here's the number one way you can cover a multitude of sins. Don't sin to begin with. <laughs> there won't be anything to cover, right? Don't sin to begin with. Now, who in here thinks that you can go a lifetime without sinning? Come on. We, we all know better. We've preached that uh, over and over again, that we're all sinners. Even after you're saved, if any man says he's not a sinner, uh, he's lying or he's deceiving himself. And so we all are going to continue to sin. But here is something that I want to suggest to you, okay? A very practical thing to think about. <clears throat> the smaller the sins are, Okay, you know, I'm going to have to go back and explain my message from this morning because it's going to sound like I'm contradicting it. But the smaller the sins are, the easier they are to cover up later on. Does that make, does, <laughs> am I, am I, does anyone think I'm preaching heresy here? here? So here's what I mean. You're going to sin, but at the very least, keep those sins very small. <laughs> okay, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, let me tell you what I preached this morning. You're in James already. So look at James uh, chapter 2, or maybe you're not in James. My, I was in James. Look at James chapter 2 real briefly. Uh, we got visitors here, uh, uh, Neil and Lynn, and, uh, and they were here this morning. They're getting the full treatment, man. Iola, Kansas City. Uh, I don't know if that means uh, that my mom and Tim are good friends or bad friends, but <laughs> they're putting them through the whole treatment, and so I'm glad they're here. They had to already hear this, and I'm going to just recap just – Really, really quickly, chapter 2, verse 10 of James says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. 
And so the bottom line is, if you sin, even a, uh, the most minor of a sin, okay, in the context here, he's talking about being a respecter of persons. Who hasn't been a respecter of persons at some point, right? We might look at Revelation 21a, that's where it took, the, took him this morning, and said, hey, even a lie, somebody who tells a lie, right? You know, the, this still, you're still, you've still broken God's laws, you've still fallen short of his expectations. We understand that in terms of our salvation. Uh, but not only that, as Christians, we should look at that and say, you know what, I understand that, you know, I'm, I might not commit adultery, but the same God who said don't commit adultery, you know, said don't kill is, the, is what he uses in James. But you could go down the list in the Ten Commandments. Same God that said don't kill said don't covet. Same God that said don't steal, you know, said uh, uh, what, all, these, <laughs> all these other things, you know. Don't covet, don't, uh, don't commit adultery, don't kill. And so, you know, the same God is giving us all these commandments. Our objection shouldn't be like, well, what can I get away with doing? You know what I mean? Our objection should be like, I love God. I don't want to sin against him. And even if we offend in the smallest point, according to James, look, we, we, we are still guilty of all. We're still guilty of, of all that. So I don't mean to contradict that by what I'm saying here in James 5. Uh, I mean, what I'm saying here uh, with this text here, but, but from a human perspective, we're all going to at times sin against somebody else and we're going to have to ask them for their forgiveness. Isn't it a whole lot easier to just forgive somebody for something that, man, I didn't even think that was a big deal. You know, <clears throat> I, I was mentioning this morning too, how uh, prophets of God, oftentimes if they saw an angel or a manifestation of God in some, some form and they're talking and they say, uh, uh, you know, they fall on their face. And sometimes they would say, you know, I, I have an unclean, I'm, I'm a unclean lips. Right. Even the very words that come out of my mouth are unclean. Have you ever had somebody as a as a, when people find out I'm a pastor, it happens a lot, but they'll just use their common vernacular, which nowadays a common vernacular is like a, a, cuss, a cuss word, a profane word, like every other word. You know, sometimes they like multiple times and you're like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, I know what all those words mean and you just didn't use them right. <laughs> but it's just like it just comes out just but when they find out you're a pastor, they can't control themselves because they're so used to talking that way. And then they do it. And then they're just like, oh, I'm sorry. Because they feel like, you know, hey, I just. And to me, it's always like, man, it's, a, it's just a word. You know what I mean? It's not like you just committed. It's not like you just, you know, beat up my kid or something, something like that. But you know what? That's how we ought to feel as Christians. Like every even the smallest thing that we do, it's just like, I'm sorry. I offended. I offended you. I offended God. Now I'm not talking about being false, this false humility, but I'm just, I'm saying that we should go to somebody when we've done the smallest of things and be like, you know what? We need to cover this sin. We need to get it exposed, deal with it, and then put it to rest. And then you bring it up and they're just like, come on, who apologizes for that? Right? But hey, isn't that a whole lot easier to forgive than coming to somebody and being like, hey, man, uh, you know, I, uh, I had an affair, <laughs> you know, or some, what's a major thing? I killed somebody. I mean, can you go to somebody and do some major sin uh, and expect them to just overlook it and be like, you know what? That's all right, brother. I still love you. No, I mean, they, they probably still do love you, but there are different level, varying degrees of our sins as far as the consequences that they have and the destructing uh, value that they might bring. So as a preventative maintenance, you know, try not to sin, but when you sin, make sure that there's, there's, there's small sins, insignificant sins. Now, I, I realize that seems contradictory, uh, and some might, people might have a hard time with that, but here's the thing. There are sins, norm, we're going to sin every day. You know, just a just a the thought of foolishness is sin. You know what I mean? And but there are some things in our life that if we do it, probably we messed up along the way, and there were a lot of red flags that we ignored. You know, or a lot of uh, safety net you know walls that would have prevented us from doing such and such, but. Clearly, they weren't there if we got all the way to that big sin. Does that make sense? This big, grievous sin. Usually, those are easier to put walls around and a hedge of protection and be like, you know what? I'm going to put these things in place. For instance, and I bring this up a lot, you know, there shouldn't be any reason, you know, even if I were to lust after another woman, there shouldn't 
be any reason that I would ever commit adultery with another woman. Why? Because I have a policy. I'm never alone with any women. <laughs> if you're not alone with the woman, you can't really commit an adultery, <laughs> adultery with them. Okay. So you put plans in your life to say, well, that's a really big thing. I think I can stop that from happening, you know, and, uh, and, and, and there's, there's things you can do. So spend your life not trying to live your whole life, you know, man, I really messed up this time. How can I fix that? Well, you know, start working on putting things in a place that will stop you from doing those, uh, those big sins. Okay? And, of course, if you are pretty much got control over all the big sins, the things that would like get you kicked out of church or something like that, you got control of those, well, great. Start working on, you know, keeping yourself from doing those smaller ones. It's just an ent uh, a whole life endeavoring to live, you know, the most spiritual, Christ-like life you can. It's easier to cover the smaller sins. All sin... All sins are wrong, but we should try to refrain, and we should try to refrain from any of it. Okay, but the bigger, more damaging ones, uh, they should be easier to avoid. So I said the secret to every step is love. Go to James again, James chapter two, and I just we just talked about James uh, James two ten. What am I doing here? All right, so James 2.10 is what said, uh, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, let's back up to verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the, according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinc uh, convinced of the law as trans trans transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So look what he started this whole thing by saying, look, if you will, uh, if you will fulfill the royal law, which is love your neighbor as yourself, right, then you will do well. You won't fall into sin as long as you're loving your neighbor yourself. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to steal from him. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to bear false witness. That's the one I was looking for earlier. I'm not going to bear false witness against him. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to, you know, covet after his house and his wife and, his, and all of his things, okay, uh, because I love them. I want their promotion. I want them to do well. I want them to, their, to be strengthened in the Lord. And, uh, and so that should be our motivation. And, and, and if we can find out ways to love other people, then we will refrain from, uh, uh, from sinning against them. So that's the first way that we can help, uh, that can help us to cover a multitude of sins is by simply putting in some protective measures into place to stop us from committing those big damaging sins. You know, the least amount of sins that you have to cover, the better. <laughs> and the most least insignificant uh, ones, then, then, uh, then, you know, that's an, easy, that's an easier fix. All right, number two. Make sure you are forgiving of other sins, and they will be more likely to be forgiving of your sins. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, you know, you want to cover the sins. You want to deal with them, get rid of them, especially particularly the ones I'm talking about is, is when you sin against a friend or a loved one or whatever, and then you want to go back and you want to fix this matter. Well, guess what? If you didn't forgive them of the things that they did wrong, what's the likeliness that they're just going to naturally want to forgive you? Now, maybe they should be the bigger Christian. And maybe they should... But look, why don't you just take the, the appropriate measures to forgive them and to show love towards them? You need to be forgiving of others, okay? Now, we know how hypocritical it is for any of us to not be forgiving of somebody else when Christ has forgiven us of our sins, okay? And so there's the illustration that Jesus gave of the man who uh, he, he was freed from a debt. He had a very large debt. And he begged for forgiveness from his master. And his master said, okay, I forgive you this debt. And then he turned around and he had a servant that had a little bitty debt. And he like grabs him by the throat. And he's like, pay everything that you owe. And, and Jesus is trying to show the absurd, you know, uh, illustration there of this guy that was forgiven this huge debt. But yet he won't forgive somebody of a little debt. Look, Jesus forgave us of all of our sins, right? Past, present, future they're under his blood. They're covered from in that way, right? 
how hypocritical for us to not having to not have a forgiving nature and be willing to forgive somebody whenever they sin against us. Okay, so we need to be willing to do that. Look at Colossians three now, talking about making sure that you're forgiving others. All right, Colossians 3. I love Colossians 3. Look at chapter uh, 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, again, what's charity? Charity is a type of love. In fact, many uh, modern versions change charity and they just switched it to love, which is incorrect. Charity is slightly different connotation. You know, you got love as a pretty general word, Charity would have to do with like the love that is demonstrated by your actions. That's why we would say like giving to charity or something like that. You're giving. That's the idea. And so, so this kind of love is an action that uh, that you know you're showing to others through through this charity. But anyway, that's another matter. Uh, so Colossians is talking about this uh, charity, and it calls it this phrase here. It says the bond of perfectness. <clears throat> Now, this is an interesting word, and when you compare it to our text here in 1 Peter 4 and in James 5, where it talks about covering a multitude of sins, uh, you can see a similar similar intent here in what he's saying. If you love other people, if you're motivated by charity and you do things for them to demonstrate your love, uh, then it it, it calls it the bond of perfectness. Now, I might get this wrong, but I want to tell you in my mind, just kind of, kind of by way of illustration, what I think of. Anybody ever try to, to build anything like woodwork? I don't know. We got any builders in here? You do some woodworking or, or something like that. Maybe carpentry. Okay. If you're shaking your head and you're like, no way. Hey, I'm in the same boat. I'm not good at that stuff. I do like messing around a little bit and trying to do that. But I'm gonna tell you what I found, and maybe because it's, I'm bad at math or whatever. But you know, if I'm cutting angles, like let's say I'm cutting some baseboards. And I'm wanting them to fit. And so I got to get that angle just like 45 degrees. Get the Sounds real easy, right? But for some reason, every time I cut it, get them together, hey, that doesn't match. That doesn't look right. I'm going to tell you how I cover that. Caulk. <laughs> put some caulk in there, the paintable kind, right? Sand it maybe down a little bit. After you're done, put some paint on that. Wow, that looks perfect. It's not, <laughs> but it looks perfect because I covered it in, right? Some glue, you know, something breaks, you just kind of glue it, you just kind of replace it and, uh, and, and fix it up. Uh, you got a little hole in the wall. Man, I'm telling you, it's, it's hard to cut uh, drywall and make this drywall fit this other. Some people are great at it. It's like they just put it in, it's just like a perfect fit and they really don't have to do much. Me, I'm like, man, that's a huge gap, but that's right. I got lots of tape, lots of mud. <laughs> So I just tape that up and I mud it and, and that doesn't look good. I sand it a little bit, mud it some more. After you paint it, nobody will tell. Well, they can tell sometimes, but <laughs> you, get the, uh, you get the picture. <clears throat> Man, we're so imperfect in our life, uh, uh, even as Christians, like trying to walk the Christian life, trying to serve the Lord and to do good. In our life, we're like all these like things that don't match up in these gaps and these holes and these dents and these dings and all this kind of stuff. But praise the Lord. Number one, we're, praise the Lord that we don't have to pay for that in hell. <laughs> it's covered, man. We're washed in the blood of the lamb. Uh, you know, he's bore that, born that price for us. Uh, we don't have to do it. But on this Christian life, man, we're still going to mess up. We're still going to cause others grief. We're still going to fight and have all these complicated stress and depression and all these kinds of things that happen in this fallen life. But aren't you glad that when you love somebody and you demonstrate and you act on that love, 
it's that bond of perfectness. And I might be getting that actual like definition of bond of perfectness down, but, but I like that illustration, <laughs> okay? Because sometimes in my life, I know I require a lot of mud and tape and paint, okay? And, uh, and so look, the simple solution here is just be loving and forgiving to others, show mercy to them. They're gonna be less likely to hold a grudge against you. And later on down the road, they're gonna be forgiving uh, of you as well. If that's what it means to cover a multitude of sins, and I believe that it does, hey, that's one way to cover it. Be loving towards each other, be forgiving of others, and they will forgive you as well. All right, number three. We're going to go back to Proverbs 17 on this one. Let's go ahead and go there. Proverbs chapter 17. <clears throat> I'll read it. I'll read it to you first, and then I'll tell you what the last point is. Proverbs 17, verse 19. He he loveth. No, no, where am I at? Proverbs 17, verse 19. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 9. That's what I'm doing. Wrong. Okay, verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. Okay, let's go back to the definition. What do I mean by cover? Deal with it, take care of it, get it out of the way, try to make it right. Okay, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Okay, the third point is this. Once a sin is covered, make sure it stays uncovered. Bury it. You know what I mean? It's done. It's done away with. Aren't you glad that Christ doesn't bring our sins up every time, you know? Uh, we, we do something wrong. I mean, we might in our own minds never be able to get rid of it, but he's not holding that against us. We're moved on and we go, look, the, every godly Bible character, you know, you're just like, oh, like, look, look at all these great men of God. And you're just going down the list and you're like, Abraham, yeah, he lied, <laughs> right? David, oh yeah, he committed a, a adultery and then he had uh, the Bathsheba's husband killed and, and you're going down. These are the great men of God. And you're like, you know, uh, Moses killed somebody with his bare hand. And you're just, <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking of just a handful, but there's so many that you could go and you're looking at all these great men of God. Well, guess what? All these great men of God were human and they all messed up. They made mistakes. And so God, when he deals with them, he's not like, you know, t for the most part. Now their sins might've hindered them from being able to do something. There's some things you can't get rid of your life. Like sometimes a sin might disqualify you from something like maybe a certain office, you know, in the church or might disqualify you from being able to do certain things. But for the most part, when God deals with his people, he's not bringing that back up. Like, yeah, you remember when you did that sin? It's like, oh God, I thought you forgave me for that sin. <laughs> you know, he's going to, uh, he's, go he's so uh, forgiving. And that's why we need to be with other people. When they've done us wrong, we say, hey, you know what? I want to I wanna reveal this thing. I want to take care of it. I want to cover it up. I want to bury it and never bring it up again, right? That is the best way uh, to apply this idea of covering a multitude of sins. If you are seeking to be loving, don't keep bringing things up that have already been dealt with. Now, when we love the Lord and we love others, uh, the Bible talks about this, how we are at that point, we're not really bound by the commandments. Okay, Jesus talks about, he just summarized all the commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Love thy neighbor as thyself, uh, which is the royal law we talked about. And so if we're loving God and we're loving other people, look, we don't have to go through this whole life thinking like, well, now what did the Bible say? Like I heard that there's 600 laws in the Old Testament. Like, you know, like, where's the law about this? How far can I go on this? I mean, uh, you know, if I, if I do this, you know, uh, uh, how can I? I mean, people really read the Bible that way. Like, you know, what can I get away with? Like how far do I have to go on this? Look, if you're motivated by love, you're going to go above and beyond probably what you're expected to do anyway. And you're just going to say, hey, I just want to do this because I love God. I want to do this because I love other people. And, uh, and we're not really bound by the commandments in that way. 1 Timothy 1.5 says this, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. All right, Genuine faith is going to be that which includes charity, uh, and a good conscience, and out of a good conscience and a pure heart. 
And that doesn't mean we're never going to sin, obviously. It doesn't mean we're never going to struggle with loving people or we're going to love properly all the time. It doesn't mean we won't have to pay for the sins that we commit. You know, it's not like you, you, you don't have to. I mean, how many people would just, you know, get sentenced to jail and then be like, you know what? I made it right. I prayed. God forgave me. Now I don't have to go to jail, right? No, sorry. You're still going to have to pay for, for what you did. And that's life. But God can give you peace and God can, can uh, release you from that. And he can cover that and make it where it is no longer hindering your walk or your relationship with others. And you can be more effective for the cause of Christ. Uh, and if we do sin, these are some good things to remember when it comes to covering our sin, okay? Uh, number one, hopefully you've put into, into place some preventative maintenance, you know, that will stop you from committing those great sins, uh, those big sins. Number two, you make sure that you are forgiving of other sins so they'll be more likely to forgive yours. And then once a sin is covered, make sure it stays covered. Now, for the conclusion, I told you I was going to tell you what I used to think that this meant. Many of these verses talk about charity covering a multitude of sins or if you convert somebody from their errors you know then you've covered a multitude of sins I'm, I'm butchering that passage and I used to think that hey the more that we go soul winning and uh, and you know we love people and we preach the gospel the more that that's gonna like God's gonna just kind of like okay well that that'll cover the multitude of sins that you did now could you make that application look bottom line is this Tell people, I mean, preach the gospel to people, you know, <laughs> tell people the gospel, you know, try to be a Christian and be an example to other people. That's probably going to help you in your Christian life. I know for, for me and the times of my life that I'm out there doing the most, like witnessing and all that stuff, it makes me want to live a better life. It makes me want to read my Bible. It makes me want to love people, you know, so, so it certainly could help you to love other people. But does soul winning itself and going out and preaching the gospel itself, does that cover your sins? Well, no. I mean, it plays a part in the fact that we love other people. If that's our motivation for soul winning, it should be. The reason you go out there soul winning should be because, number one, you love the Lord and he's told you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Number two, you love people and you don't want them to go to hell. So you're preaching them the gospel and you're giving them a chance to be saved. You know, all those should be made, motivated in love. And if they are motivated in love, well, then, yeah, I suppose all these things are going to going to apply. But the main application there when it comes to covering a multitude of sins I think it's going to take work. It's going to take going to that person and getting things right. It's going to take uh, forgiving people. It's going to take doing all these things that the Bible is just clear from cover to cover that this is how Christians are supposed to be. You say, well, I thought that was just New Testament. It's Leviticus that says, love your neighbor as thyself. <laughs> right? It's from cover to cover. This is uh, the way that we're supposed to live as Christians. Okay? So, uh, do the best you can in your life to cover a multitude of sins. And uh, here, those are some tips that will help you to be able to do that after you have committed uh, sin. Lord, I pray for your blessings on, the serf, on this uh, service and on the uh, folks here today. I pray that you be with them, uh, those folks going out soul winning afterwards, and that you would give them boldness and fill them with your spirit, Lord, that they might have uh, wisdom and uh, discernment as they go out to preach your word. I pray that you'll give them a good day, control the, uh, uh, the situations around them and the traffic and the, uh, the different events at the doors, dogs and all that kind of stuff. Lord, just help them have a good day of soul winning. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to consider all that we've heard today in the different messages and apply it to our lives that we might serve you better and that we might grow in your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.